Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I'm Marie Renvelez with USC Visions and Voices, the Arts and Humanities Initiative. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's event, Cartography of Poets, Maps, Archives, and Locating the Poetic. This event was originally scheduled to happen in April this year. And while the pandemic forced us to transition to an online format, we are so grateful and excited that this virtual event now allows us to accommodate so many people who are coming in right now and to have folks tuning in from across the country. At Visions and Voices, we believe it's important to open our events by acknowledging the indigenous land that we share. By presenting conversations like the one we have tonight, part of the work that we do is to make the invisible visible. We also believe that it is not the responsibility of those who have been made invisible to remind us that they are still here. Therefore, the Visions and Voices program acknowledges that the University of Southern California was built on the ancestral and sacred land of the Tongva Nation. We honor the Tongva and all indigenous people, past, present, and future, and we pay respect to their continued survival and contributions to our society. We also honor the legacy of the African diaspora and recognize that this country would not exist without the free enslaved labor of black people. We share these acknowledgements to raise awareness about the histories that are too often erased or forgotten, to pay respect to the original caretakers of this land and to recognize our place in this history. We hope that this work continues beyond our events and helps to inform our individual and collective actions in the years ahead and for generations to come. Thank you. Before uh, the rest of the event gets going, I would like to do just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, please use the chat to submit your questions to our poets. All chats will also only be going to the host and will not be available for public view. I would now like to hand this off to the wonderful people who have worked hard on the organizing and production for tonight's event with, this, with these amazing California poets. Please welcome the Dean of the USC Libraries, Catherine Quinlan. Thank you, Marie, and good evening, everyone. And I'd like to join Marie in thanking you for joining us for this event, um, Cartography of Poets, Maps, Archives, and Locating the Poetic. When we conceived the broad outlines of an event about locating the poetic, we assumed that we'd be gathering with a group of poets in Doheny Memorial Library on USC's campus. In Doheny, the library's collections would be all around us, including some of our rarest books, manuscripts, and archives of other literary artists. The physical presence of the collections informed our thinking about this event. The history of Los Angeles and California is among our greatest strengths as a research library. And our idea was to invite poets to be figuratively and literally in conversation with the ideas of California that our collections embody. Of course, most of us aren't at the library or on campus, or maybe not even in Los Angeles or California. We've come together virtually, and those collections are physically far from us. And although it's not what we had in mind, we're doing what libraries always have worked to do create and sustain a community, a community of curiosity, of creative practice and discovery. The poets with us this evening are here during a global pandemic, a national uprising against state sanctioned violence and racial injustice, and a West Coast outbreak of unprecedented forest fires. I don't know about you, but I'm in an evacuation warning zone and there's a hell of a lot of smoke in the air. I'm very grateful for them, their time and work, and for their helping to create this moment of virtual community around the poets and poetry of California. When I mentioned earlier that regional history is among our library strengths, I didn't mean only the political, social, and geographical history of Los Angeles and California. The creative history of our city and state also lives in our collections. That's true in many ways, but one is particularly relevant tonight. We have many writers' archival collections, their papers, manuscripts, correspondence, and other materials that document their creative lives. That includes architects, dancers, composers, literary artists, poets among them. I'm delighted to share with all of you that our collaborator in this event, my great friend David St. John, has made the USC Libraries the home of his personal archives. 
David's collection is full of drafts of his poetry, unpublished works, and a tremendous amount of literary correspondence with Jory Graham, Michael Harper, W.S. Merwin, Adrian Rich, and so many other writers. It includes rare hand-printed books, typed manuscripts, autographed postcards, and a large amount of material relating to Philip Levine and others known collectively as the Fresno Poets. Thank you, David, for entrusting our USC libraries with this collection of immeasurable intellectual, literary, and historical significance. I'm also so very grateful that you've agreed to help us continue to strengthen our archival collections related to California poetry and be more inclusive of less visible literary voices. The collections we're building together will be an incredible source of knowledge, insight, and inspiration for academic and creative communities at USC and far beyond. So I'd like to finish by thanking all of you once more for joining us and to all the writers we're about to meet. It's truly a wonder to have this group of accomplished poets all in one place, virtual or otherwise. Please remember that if you've signed up for our Amundsen Lab workshop related to this event, it will take place immediately after the reading and discussion. I'd like to acknowledge Marie Wren and all of our excellent partners at USC Visions and Voices, as well as the library's very own Tyson Gaskill and Patty Johnson for all their work in making events like this possible and meaningful. To continue our program, please join me in welcoming USC University Professor, USC Dornsack English Department Chair, and California poet, David St. John. Thank you so much, Dean Quinlan. And thanks to everyone at Vo Visions and Voices and to Tyson, Patty, for helping to create the event tonight. And let me welcome all of you who are watching. The six of us who will be reading poems tonight are all California poets, even Garrett, who's been living in Oregon. And we'll be reading work that represents not only the extraordinary diversity of California, but also its broad aesthetic and geographical reach, its ecological urgency, its work that shows also the powerful multiplicity of voices in the poetry of California. Poets often write from a home place where the imagination can take hold, somewhere that exists in actuality or memory or the imagination, but all interwoven. And poets write also of the places and the people they encounter in the course of their lives. And it's those experiences that become the coordinates with which they create the indelible maps of their own journeys, which are their poems. A poet's cartography is often intimate and an intimate braiding of both personal and public reflections. Each poem enacts its own cartography of self in history, in time, and in place. And so I'm so pleased to say that we'll begin our encounters with California poetry this evening with an esteemed former state poet laureate, Dana Joya. Hello from the North Country. Uh, I think that among on this cartography, I'm probably uh, at the highest point north. Uh, it's a pleasure to begin this celebration, although I ask you to pardon my smoky voice. Uh, like everyone else, I've been living under a cloud for the last uh, three weeks. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, at a USC event, uh, if I were the opening uh, speaker, it was appropriate to begin with Robinson Jeffers, uh, who was the first uh, USC alum uh, to become an internationally known writer. Uh, his life changed at USC in the way that we hope some uh, are, it will happen for our students. He found his vocation. Uh, he found uh, the love of his life, and he embarked on a creative journey. I've picked uh, a famous, though unusual, poem uh, to begin with. 
largely because it's one of his shortest poems. We think of Jeffers as being the poet of environmental consciousness, but this is, I think appropriately for the occasion, a poem about poetry. Uh, it is a poem about what the art can achieve uh, and what it cannot. In other words, about the futility of art and the power of art. It's all based around uh, a metaphor of a stone carver carving an inscription on, on a monument or a gravestone. For the Stonecutters by Robinson Jeffers. Stonecutters fighting time with marble, you four defeated challengers of oblivion. Eat cynical earnings, knowing rock splits, records fall down, the square-limbed Roman letters scale in the thaws, wear in the rain. The poet, as well, builds his monument mockingly, for man will be blotted out, the blithe earth die, the brave sun die blind and blacken in the heart. Yet stones have stood for a thousand years, and pained thoughts found honey of peace in old poems. I really like the fact that uh, a poem you know, under 12 lines can contain the end of the universe, uh, as well as a kind of ars poetica. Uh, you know, that's Jeffers in the very early part of the 20th century. Uh, here's a poem from the end of the 20th century. It's by one of the poets in California I just absolutely adore. Uh, her name is Shirley Gyaklin Lim. Uh, she was born in Singapore of mixed parentage, Malaysian and Chinese. She came to the United States, and she's a, actually an extraordinarily famous uh, post-colonial scholar, uh, none of which I have read. I've simply read uh, her poems, and, and I really have, you know, a, 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 you know, a small shelf full of, of, of Shirley's poems. And, I, and she came once uh, to speak to my class and simply dazzled the students. Uh, she has many wonderful poems about immigration, which is one of the great themes of California poetry, because almost all of us, except for, you know, for the native tribes, are immigrants here. Some have, have arrived uh, long ago, some are, have arrived last week. Uh, and this is a, a, one of her several poems about the process of immigration, of assimilation, and of resistance. Uh, it's called Learning to Love America. And it begins with a, a, a kind of argument with William Carlos Williams in the first line, who said, the pure products of America go crazy. Learning to love America. Because it has no pure products, because the Pacific Ocean sweeps along the coastline, because the water in the ocean is cold, because land is better than ocean. Because I say we rather than they. Because I live in California, I have eaten fresh artichokes and jacarandas bloom in April and May. Because my senses have caught up with my body, my breath with the air it swallows, my hunger with my mouth because I walk barefoot in my house, because I have nursed my son at my breast, because he is a strong American boy, because I have seen his eyes redden when he is asked who he is, because he answers, I don't know. Because to have a son is to have a country because my son will bury me here, because countries are in our blood and we bless them, because it is late and too late to change my mind, because it is time. Just a wonderful poem, I think, suffused with, with, uh, with love and with insight. And I'm going to keep on my time so I don't hold up uh, the other readers. I'd like to end a poem of my own. Uh, this is a poem about the California landscape. 
which is different from the landscape of the rest of the United States. It's about the seasons of California, which are different from the seasons elsewhere, and about the particular kind of beauty that the dry California landscape has, even in the heat of summer, which natives respond to, but which is so puzzling to outsiders, especially Easterners. California hills in August. I can imagine someone who found these fields unbearable, who climbed the hillside in the heat, cursing the dust, cracking the brittle weeds underfoot, wishing a few more trees for shade. An Easterner especially, who would scorn the meagerness of summer, the dry twisted shell shapes of black elm, scrub oak, and chaparral, a landscape August had already drained of green. One who would hurry over the clinging thistle, foxtail, golden poppy, knowing everything was just a weed. Unable to conceive that these trees and sparse brown bushes were alive and hate the bright stillness of the noon without wind, without motion, the only other living thing, a hawk, hungry for prey, suspended in the blinding sunlit blue. And yet, how gentle it seems to someone raised in a landscape short of rain, the skyline of a hill broken by no more trees than one can count, the grass, the empty sky, the wish for water. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, a poet who was, you know, raised actually not far from where I went to high school in Gardena, uh, Garrett Hongo. I really want to congratulate David St. John for choosing three poets from Gardena. We, uh, we take up 50% of uh, the population of the cartography of poets on the bill today. That's so wise of him. Uh, um, I'm going to start with reading from the poetry of my first poetry teacher, Bert Myers, who was from LA, born there, and died in Claremont too early in 1979, while he was on the faculty of Pitzer College. He, uh, unlike some of us, did not go to Gardena for high school. He went to Marshall. And he grew up in um, pretty much what's called central LA now. He's a poet of great imagery, um, a kind of somber aestheticist. Um, he learned this, I think, from observing so many acute things while he worked as first a janitor and a carpenter and then a worker in an airplane factory. He never finished high school or college. But he did enter the PhD at Claremont Grad School and get hired just on the basis of his wonderful poetry and mm, learning. Um, this is a poem that was unpublished at his death and collected in a book called From a Dybbuk's Raincoat. And he writes a lot about LA and this is very much like that work. Um, it's also full of a kind of political rage, which I think was prescient. It's called Once in Los Angeles. I woke up one morning, looked out the window and saw tomorrow in the street today. All the people were there. They had a lot to say. They talked and danced and sang for hours. The office buildings swayed like flowers. The freeways rose and went another way, towards paradise, across the sea, into the sky, where the red balloon is president and ideals never die. Then I heard the sirens and saw the cops come down on every woman, man, and child in that enlightened town. But suddenly, a shining saucer stopped over City Hall. 
angels walked upon the air, stretched out their rainbow hands, and stopped that massacre. The cops and cars just disappeared. People seemed to float and fly around. And there was a paradise near first and spring. The angels left without a sound. I chose to read again uh, from another Southern California poet. In many ways, my closest contemporary, the poet Mark Jarman, who grew up in Redondo Beach, though he had the misfortune of having been born outside of California. Um, he writes a lot about our great landscapes, our seascapes, surfing, and growing up in a sort of dilapidated urban environment that was his teenage years in Redondo Beach on the Esplanade and the old pier there. This poem I've chosen is from a little north of us. It's called Dispatches from Devereux Slough. It takes place in Goleta uh, near Santa Barbara. And I'll just read the last three sections. Mark, um, I encourage you to read oh, a lot of his work. Um, this is called The Crystal Ship, and some of you might pick up on that. Uh, Sands Beach, Goleta. The famous rock star thought up his famous rock song while gazing out at the oil derrick offshore. Lit up at night, it might look to stoned eyes like a faceted galleon, perfect for a song. Tonight, as sunset gives off its green flash, the derrick has that look, and so does the oil barge, docked to it, dead black, filling up with cargo. To a dead sea lion at Sands Beach. You had returned from dry land back to water, preferring it and welcomed the new limbs, webbed to conceal your toe and finger bones. You rolled along the surf, all memory of other motion swept back in your wake and ended here among fly buzzing kelp. Sleek swimmer drowned and with your unwebbed bones. Heaven. When we are unite, reunited after death, the owl will call among the eucalyptus. The white tailed kite will arc across the mesa and sunset cast orange light from the Pacific. Against the golden bush and eucalyptus, where flowers and fruit and seeds appear all seasons, and our paired silhouettes are waiting for us. Now, I'm gonna read from an LA poem of my own and switch my glasses because my print is fire than the others. Um, this is a poem about a place called Koreatown now, back when my family and I first came there in 1957. It was called Midtown. Um, and it was a neighborhood of apartments for all kinds of immigrants from all over the country and the world. Um, all sorts of Asians, African-Americans from the South, Mexican Americans, and my childhood was filled with all these languages and all these people, and this great beyond of an unbordered city. Um, it's also a tracking shot of waiting for my mom to come home up a, a hill that we lived on. And some of you might recognize um, the geography here or this the cartography. It's called yellow light. One arm hooked around the frayed strap of a tar black patent leather purse. The other cradling something for dinner. Fresh bunches of spinach from a J-Town yaoya. Sides of split Spanish mackerel from Alvisos. Maybe a loaf of Langendorf. She steps off the hissing bus at Olympic and fig begins the three block climb up the hill, passing gangs of schoolboys playing war, Japs against Japs, 
Chicanos chalking sidewalks with the holy double yolk crosses of hopscotch, and the Korean grocer's wife out for a stroll around this neighborhood of Hawaiian apartments just started to steam with cooking and the anger of young couples coming home from work, yelling at kids, flicking on TV sets for the Wednesday night fights. If it were May, hydrangeas and jacaranda flowers in the streetside trees would be blooming through the smog of late spring. Wisteria Masuda's front yard would be shaking out the long tresses of its purple hair. Maybe mosquitoes, moths, a few orange butterflies settling on the lattice of monkey flowers, tangled in chain link fences by the trash. But this is October, and Los Angeles sees like a billboard under twilight. From used car lots, from used car lots at the movie houses uptown, long silver, sil silver sticks of light probe the sky. From the Miracle Mile, whole freeways away, a brilliant fluorescence breaks out and makes war with the dim squares of yellow kitchen light, winking on in all the side streets of the barrio. She climbs up the two flights of flagstone stairs to 201B, the spikes of her high heels clicking like kitchen knives on a cutting board, props the groceries against the door, fishes through memo pads, a compact, empty packs of chewing gum, and finds her keys. The moon then, cruising from behind a screen of eucalyptus across the street, covers everything, everything in sight, in a heavy light like yellow onions. And it's my great pleasure to introduce my fellow alum from Gardena High School, the fine poet Robin Cost Lewis, who almost also happens to be the poet laureate of Los Angeles and a faculty member of our sponsoring institution, USC. Robin. Tyson. You guys can hear me now, okay? Um, uh, it's really hard. I mean, it's really easy to be very cynical right now, and for very good reason. Uh, I arrived here today a little gray, and now, as always, poetry has saved me and softened me and opened me. So thank you very much uh, just for allowing me to be in the audience, and I can't believe I get to be uh, share the virtual stage in such esteemed company. And yes, Gardena High is strictly number one, Mr. Hongo. <laughs> um, I'm also really honored to be here uh, for the occasion of uh, USC acquiring David St. John's archive, which is to say, and without any kind of hyperbole, an American treasure. David's my boss, y'all. And he's so humble, you know, just the things that were just mentioned about what's in his archive. I think this every time I have conversations with him, it's like, I just want to sit down and listen to you. And I feel very much the same way about everyone um, with whom I'm reading today. I'm going to stop talking before I get emotional. It might be too late. I'm just honored to be here and for such a beautiful occasion. Thank you. I'm going to read one of my favorite poems. I'm sorry if you've heard me read it before. It's uh, Wanda Coleman's Dream Walk. Actually, I'm not sorry. I really don't care. I plan to read this poem every time, I, every chance I get until the day I die. Um, uh, it, it's called, uh, it's number seven. It's a, from a series called Dream Walk by Wanda Coleman. Fear drives you to tears and out of the house during arguments with mama for long walks on sweltering summer eves. The moths come, collect on grainy stucco porches, are hosed away at sunrise. You stare at shaded windows, struggle to decipher the lives inside. Who are they? Do they see you out here watching? 
Won't some sympathetic someone invite you in for tea? Cars are being washed and turtle waxed by loving hands. Preteeners play dodgeball on vacant lots. The librarian admonishes you for staying so late and not having brought your card. Palms nod against the neon rainbow sky. The moths come and the starlings and the dragonflies. You know something is important is going to happen to you. Hurry, you whisper. Please, hurry. The second poem I'm going to read is by the Vietnamese writer, Le Thi Dinh Thuy. Uh, I just want to quickly, uh, for those of you who don't know, because Thuy has lived on the East Coast for many, many decades, and she also is primarily a novelist, but she also writes poetry. Um, she grew up in San Diego after surviving the American War in Vietnam. Uh, her novel, The Gangster We Are All Looking For, was received uh, with incredible acclaim. And um, I begged her, I didn't have to beg her, but she graciously agreed to allow me to read this unpublished poem for you tonight. So you're getting a real treat. Uh, what she wrote regarding the death and murder, death slash murder, I shouldn't say death, the murder uh, of Emmett Till. And I wanted to read it because of course, Emmett Till's anniversary just passed on uh, August 28th. Um, so thank you to Twee. I know she's not in the audience, but I just want to thank her for being so generous. Um, for those of you in the audience who don't know who Emmett Till is, since we're at a university, and I imagine that some of you knew first years and maybe second years don't know who he is. Um, Emmett Till was a teenage boy who was 14, and he was lynched in 1955 after being accused of offending a white woman by whistling at her. He did not, uh, this other said at the time, that uh, Emmett Till, God bless this little child, had a stutter. Um, if you're sitting there going, I don't see why any of those things would, would in any way evoke um, his lynching, you're right, and um, it is an inexplicable, inexplicable nightmare that is America. So this is Twee's poem. P please forgive my Vietnamese for slaughtering the title. It phonetically looks like the word song twice, song, song, but it really is the word for river and life, song, and then song, so song, song, okay? By Li Thi Dinh Thuy. August in Mississippi, a stuttering boy saying Mississippi, whistling his way through the word, whistling in order to make his way through the word. He is on the train, no. He is on the bus, no. He is a boy much beloved by his mother. She, sa she saved up to send him from Chicago to Mississippi, that long lettered far away place. He is going to the land of so many, so many, so many S's. By train whistle, down he goes, our Emmett. Fourteen-year-old, beautiful, hazel-eyed boy riding the train whistle down. Bye now, boo. She doesn't need to say, behave yourself. He is her pride. He is her boy. He is her boo. He knows he is, carrying the both of them. Now, inside the whistle, she taught him to sound. So many, so many, so many S's. And then I'm going to close with my own poem, Math. And I think that's all I'm going to say about it, Math. And then at some point, as you step more vigilantly into the middle of your life, you begin to realize that they are all dead. Or more honestly, it takes even more years, you begin to realize that perhaps they are not at all supposed to be dead. Or you still remember, you can still feel yourself there, standing, 
knee deep in cement, a particular square on the sidewalk. There were dandelions, that odd eternal sun, when a dear friend, your sister's best best friend, drives by, stops her car in the middle of the street and then tells you, screams it out of her window and says it. Your first beloved, that boy for whom you were slowly unfolding yourself from inside outward, that boy whom you had yet to kiss but would one day soon kiss, certainly, that monumental boy who smiled at you differently, that boy, had just been shot and killed by strangers just for fun. And it is the very first day when the world confirms that new gleam of suspicion layered on the surface of the dark violet lake inside you that, yes, slaughter is normal. Slowly over the years, you train yourself not to want this. You, a body in your bed with whom you can have a real conversation, a body with whom you can walk anywhere, talk anywhere, hear anywhere. At some point, you gave up expecting to be understood. English was too many red languages at once, and history was just a very small one, a ledger, and always in the black. You took out your sheerest sword, your tongue, a sheath of arrows. Perhaps not by coincidence, once you began to trip around 50s Maypole, you and your sister find together the courage to do the math. Of all the boys whom you had known as children, at least 80% were all either missing, in jail, or dead. Blood on the streets, bullets in the wall, the police always flying overhead, in your head. You thought it normal when boys disappeared, were shot, killed, cuffed, or thrown onto a black and white hood for simply walking down the sidewalk, or asking merely, what have I done? Normal, as expected as the orange poppies, your quiet state flower blossoming on the side of the streets year round. And then, finally, you and I, our bodies together for a few hours. Time loves me. Every minute a gift so tender, each second announces itself. And then, just as quickly, equally, every second is stolen, erased, washed away. You. I understand somehow it will be another four years until I see you again. We walk through the night, arm in arm, across the wet sidewalk. And besides my son, I am the happiest I have ever been with another person. But it is a silence, a happiness that rare, unexpected, quiet. And I wait and wait. And no one shoots you afterward. Or maybe this night was God's way of saying to me, finally, yes, I do realize you exist. And this one night, just this one night, is all the complete happiness you can ever expect from me. I have the profound honor now of introducing my beloved friend and more importantly, a brilliant poet, former poet laureate of Los Angeles, City of Angels, Luis Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, it's an honor to be here among you. This is really powerful. Um, I wanted to share uh, the poetry of two California poets. By way of disclosure, they're poets that I published under my uh, poetry imprint, which is called Thea Chucha Press. God helps those who help who promote themselves. So I'm promoting my press here. But there's also a real good reason for that. I think the Atucha Press, like a lot of small presses, have brought in the voices that often don't get published in other presses. And so I feel I've been doing this for over 30 years. We've published the first books of people like Terrence Hayes, Elizabeth Alexander, um, uh, Dwight Okita, um, 
uh, Virgil Suarez, I can name uh, Louis Vett Resto, we can name a lot of people who we've published, Peter Harris and so many, and we've always been a, a press of uh, the multiplicity of voices that David talked about earlier. Uh, so I don't mind um, promoting or discussing these two poets because they're two great California poets. The first one is, um, is a poet, um, Leticia Hernandez Linares, whose book we published called uh, Mucha Muchacha, Too Much Girl in 2015. And she's Salvadorian, and it's important, I think, to point out the, the Central Americans that are live among us. They've been with us now for more than 30 years, especially because of the civil wars that they came as refugees. Civil wars that our country, unfortunately, played a very bad role in, in uh, supporting the, a lot of the dictatorships that were at, uh, running these countries at the time. And um, the Salvadorians, Guatemalans, and Hondurans are not part of our communities. They've been um, important for our communities, but a lot of their work isn't known. Uh, they've been writing for a long time. So uh, Leticia is very important also because she published the first uh, Central American uh, writing from the U.S. Uh, she was the editor of a book that Tia Chucha Press published called The Wandering Song. We're republishing it this fall. You should know The Wandering Song is the first Central American uh, literary anthology. And if anybody's got English classes or whatever, they should get this anthology. Amazing work from uh, Central Americans in, uh, from the diaspora of, of um, these countries. So I'm going to read a book, I mean, a, a poem that uh, she wrote called Despierta. And uh, she grew up in the Mission District. She still lives in the Mission District. And of course, you know, the Mission District had always had a lot of Mexicans and Central Americans. It always was rich with culture and language and foods and everything. But as you know, it's high, getting highly gentrified. I happened to live in that area. I was actually living in Bernal Heights in 1980 uh, when it was still Radio. If you go to Bernal Heights now, it's highly gentrified. People have been displaced. There's a lot of movement, as you know, in the Bay Area, just like in Los Angeles, just like in some of the big cities, inner city people are being pushed out. So that's what's happening. So this is a very important poem about the Mission District. Um, and I'm just going to read, I think it tells you more than I can ever say, by Leticia Hernandez Linares, Despierta. Mission Street yawns wide under the canopy of breaking day. Breathless footsteps tax rickety ladder rungs, chase streams of light unveiling the horizon. Sleepy hands burning sage and tar rooftop, the day just barely born. Into my desert, dusted arms wanting to hold a neighborhood hostage from itself. What a perfect mission these streets have become. Shoveling out plots for graves, lots for sale, a concentric circle of conquest carving itself into a ground overcrowded with the whispering of ghosts. If I charge the children with painting poems, will you learn to feed yourself, curled up from the crouching towards death stance you slang around the streets in? Cease to fire the barrels holes through the heads of young men guilty of nothing but brown skin. Being on foot, no car to speed past the candlelit processing of their own untimely deaths. La Piedra de Sol down La Calle Valencia reflects light from a Chicana architect's plans, shines over open doors of a community learning space, comedores bearing plates steaming with home country recuerdos, connecting writers to the next verse, amantes to inevitable missteps. Prayers printed on the feet of Dansantes resound through blocks where I learn how to make crying count. Counted murals counting wars cry close to corners where someone keeps dying from nothing, nodded while poet and cantos sing truth into sense. Calling each day to attention with the promise of sunrise and sanctuary. That's from Leticia Hernandez Linares. Um, the next poet is also a Tia Press poet, um, Chi Wan Choi, a Korean American poet who's also active in his own press. He's a founder of Red Large Press here in LA. He's very active in the poetry scene here, and I would call probably the, the least 
uh, renowned part of the poetry scene here because there's a lot of great events and venues and stuff going on that's not really not well known. Uh, but it should be. There's amazing poets coming out of every community that I visited when I was poor Lariat. There's just so, LA to me is one of the most poetic towns you can imagine, and yet it doesn't get that kind of fame. And I know Robin understands that. So, um, Chi Wan Choi is one of these great poets, and we published his book uh, called The Flood in 2010. What amazing poet! And uh, I want to share this one poem. Uh, I had a hard time trying to pick out some of the poems from these po two poets because they're all great, but here's one that um, really got to me. So it's called Scarring by Chi Wan Choi. My face in the sun, the rain returned to the graveyard, finding the left arm of God and the scar where I lose my faith in the last three words of grace. To kneel without a name, washing the feet of death with cold, dry lips, because I can't know how to ask for one more lifetime. Only cowards can write this poetry, terrified that nothing will remain of us. Footsteps washed in the storm, a sneeze muted by bombs, our skin forgotten in ovens. Outside, there is shoveling of dirt to plant roses, unable to speak loud enough terrified by the scars that hide of the healing that finds of the words that leave. Anyway, amazing. Um, so I'm going to end with a poem for me. And there's a little story to this. One is I, I, I don't know, I call myself an immigrant. I understand the whole immigrant importance. But part of the reason why is because my mother is Tarumara. Uh, that's a tribe in Chihuahua, Mexico. And uh, that tribe has connections with the tribes, the Tongva, the Tatavian, the Chubmash here in California, has connections with tribes like the Hopi, the Pueblo, the Shoshone, the Arapaho. They're all related culturally and linguistically. But of course, once the border came down, now we don't recognize each other. And so I, um, it's important for me to point out that my mother, when she had me, we lived in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Um, and she crosses the international bridge to El Paso, Texas, where I was born. But one thing you should know is that Ch El Paso, Texas is part of the Chihuahua Desert, which encompasses Chihuahua State, part of Sonora, and New Mexico. So we really were going from our land to our land. This is Tarumara land. This is the land of the Raramuri people. And so this is why it's hard for me to say I'm an immigrant. I feel like we're migrants going back to lands that we've been around for at least 10,000 years. And the border has only been there, who knows, 150 years, I can't even, but you know, it hasn't been that long. So I don't, I consider myself a migrant, like a lot of Mexicans and Central Americans who have this indigenous root, even if we don't know the tribes, because I get many Mexicans, Central Americans don't know what tribes are from, but you can see it in their faces, you can see it in the, in the way they do things, their culture, day of the dead. There's so many indigenous root of things that we bring uh, and with layers of conquest and layers of, uh, oppressions that fall on top of you, but I don't want to forget the profound root, which is indigenous. And I mentioned that because my mother um, is uh, Tarumara. She told us we were from this tribe. And I'm glad because again, how many of us Mexicans know what tribes our families are from? And, um, and it got to the point where I needed to go down. I went to the Sierra Tarumara. I went to the Copper Canyon in Chihuahua to know the people. And it was a great experience. I uh, when I got there, they weren't open to me. They were very, you know, um, just walking away because I, uh, I looked Mexican to them. <laughs> I didn't look Tarumara. I looked Mexican. They even told me, you look Mexican to us. They don't call themselves Mexican there. Tarumara, or by right, they're Raramuri. That's what they really call it. But anyway, I told them I was looking for my root. I was going back to where my mother's family was from. And they found that fascinating because they said, we think that's great because nobody comes back. We lose people, they don't come back. Then they open their doors. And I don't know if you're aware, there was at the time 80,000 people there, Tarumara, living in caves. They're one of the few cave dwellers in the world. There's some in Asia, some in, in the Middle East, uh, some in uh, um, India, there's cave dwellers, I think in, in uh, South America, but not too many of them are still around, they're still there. Um, and they went to the caves to escape the Spanish. The Spanish brought the smallpox, a lot of conquest. They had a rebellion, it got crushed, and they all ended up trying to live away 
So they open their doors. And I mentioned this because it's important for me for this poem that my mother um, uh, had me in her 20s. Now, one thing you should know about the Tarumara, if you live traditionally in the Sierra, in Copper Canyon, you are some of the healthiest people in the world. They don't have much to eat, but they eat the corn, the three sisters, you know, corn squash and beans. They, uh, they only eat uh, animals when it's winter, like deer or small rabbits. And mostly they walk for hours and hours. It's hard to get around in the Sierra. They walk for hours um, and they're healthy. They have no diabetes, no heart disease. They don't have a lot of the things that you would imagine they would have. But as soon as they live, they leave their lands. They become civilized. They get diabetes, alcoholism. They beat their wives, they beat their kids, they had a heart disease, all the things that civilized people get. It's really sad, but that's what happens. My mother was actually born in the ghetto called La Tarumara in Chihuahua City, which was full of um, displaced, uprooted native peoples. And it was rough there. I went down there too. I checked it out. There was alcoholics, uh, alcohol, you know, drunk people on the street. There was a bunch of fights. There was people sick. There was somebody put a gun on me there. It looked like LA, <laughs> you know, as far as that goes. But um, that's what happens. And so my mother, when she came here and after I was born in El Paso, I was two years old, we ended up um, moving to Watts. That was the first community we were in. Um, and so Watts is my first home here. I have a lot of great memories of Watts. Um, I went to school there, I went to 109th Street School. I, I lived, one of the houses we lived in is actually where Locke High School now it was built on top of. I've gone to Locke High School to speak to kids and I've told them we're probably talking from the living room of my old house there, you know, just to be, uh, anyway. And um, so I have a lot of roots there and, and I came back to Watts in my twenties and I worked at Bethlehem Steel. And then when I was unemployed, I'd be on welfare, just trying to survive. And my oldest kids were born in South LA when I was uh, in my twenties there. So I, the Gardena connection is that my daughter, who's now 43 years old, my son's 45, was born in Gardena because I went to the Watts Health Center there when I was on welfare and they sent her to the Gardena Hospital, my wife, so she could, my first wife, she could have my daughter born. So there's a Gardena connection there too. Anyway, the, the point is, I, I love Watts. It's one of my initial, initial homes. Of course, I lived all over East LA and, and now uh, all over LA, actually. And now I'm in the San Fernando Valley, so I'm a real LA guy. I got almost every major community in me, but Watts is very important. I want to read this poem because it's the memory of my mom, who was very sickly at the time. She had diabetes. She had thyroid problems. She had high blood pressure. She had a lot of issues. Uh, she was obese. All her teeth had, were gone because they had rotted. So um, she didn't have no teeth. And one of my earliest memories, though, is this incident in which uh, I won't want to say the poem is, describes it. It's just one of the earliest memories I have in Watts. And I want to share this poem again um, to honor all California poets, but to remember all these communities the life of these communities, the life of the people in these communities, and uh, the working class stories that don't get told, that need to be told. And um, this is to my mother, Maria Stella Rodriguez, Ramuri Tarumara. And the poem is called Heavy Blue Veins, Watts, 1959. Heavy blue veins streak across my mother's legs. Some of them bunched up into dark lumps at her ankles. Mama periodically bleeds them to relieve the pain. She carefully cuts the engorged veins with a razor and drains them into a porcelain-like metal pail called a tina. I'm small and all I remember are dreams of blood. Me drowning in a red sea, blood on sheets on the walls, splashing against the white pail on streams out of my mother's ankle, but they aren't dreams. It is mama bleeding into day and tonight, bleeding a birth of memory, my mother, my blood, by the side of the bed, me on the covers, and her slicing into a black vein and filling the pail into some dark, forbidding red nightmare, which never stops coming, never stops pouring, this memory of mama and blood and Watts.
So again, thank you so much. And um, now I want to introduce a very important, beautiful, amazing poet and a new friend, David St. John. Thank you, Luis. And thank you for those reminiscences too, which are so important. I want to read some work connected to Fresno. I grew up in Fresno in the San Joaquin Valley. And I was fortunate in that the very first week I started college there, I met an amazing young poet, Larry Levis, who was a senior. And he introduced me to his teachers, Peter Everwine, and Philip Levine, who of course would go on to win every major prize in America and become an internationally known poet. But around Phil, who was this extraordinary presence and teacher, poets began to constellate. And one of the poets there who was very important to me was Omar Salinas, Luis Omar Salinas, who in 1970 published an amazing collection called Crazy Gypsy. And it went on to sell over 5,000 copies from this small press, just a bona fide poetry bestseller. But Omar also edited one of the first anthologies of Chicano poetry, along with the feminist scholar Lillian Federman. And I want to read one of Omar's poems. <clears throat> this is from a book that was published posthumously. Omar died in 2008, and it's edited by two of his friends, Chris Buckley and John Weinberg. And this is a poem called, My Father is a Simple Man. I walk to town with my father to buy a newspaper. He walks slower than I do, so I must slow up. The street is filled with children. We argue about the price of pomegranates. I convince him it is the fruit of scholars. He has taken me on this journey and it's been life long. He's sure I'll be healthy so long as I eat more oranges. And he tells me the orange has seeds and so is perpetual. And we too will come back like orange trees. I ask him what he thinks about death. And he says he will gladly face it when it comes, but won't jump out in front of a car. I'd gladly give my life for this man with a sixth grade education, whose kindness and patience are true. The truth of it is, he's the scholar. And when the bitter, hard reality comes at me like a punishing, evil stranger, I can always remember that here was a man who was a worker and a provider who learned the simple facts in life and lived by them, who held no pretense. And when he leaves without benefit of fanfare or applause, I shall have learned what little there is about greatness. Omar Salinas. One of 
my other contemporaries at Fresno was a really remarkable poet, Roberta Spear. And Roberta published th three collections of poems before her, her death from leukemia in 2003. Um, the book I'm reading from, which is called A Sweetness Rising, was edited by her former teacher and then lifelong friend, Philip Levine. I'm really pleased to say that as a gift from her cousin, the artist, Susan Weller, Roberta's papers, her archive, her drafts, her letters and books will also be going into special collections at USC. This poem shows Roberta's exquisite lyric grace, and it's one of her love poems. It's called The White Dress. I want you to see me in it. The mere which is an image that invents every movement. When I spin, I enter the seven precious stages of flight. The room is as leave lively as a dovecote. Again, I turn and stop, looking into your eyes where the feathers are drifting down over my thighs and knees. The cloth obeys the curves of my body. It is as simple as this, a white dress. Later, we will leave the party and walk the cool sidewalks toward the highway where junipers nod in the wind. When my skirt ripples out into darkness, you will move me like a sail in its first gentle breaths toward the open sea. White is a mixture of many understandings. The bare arm, the angle of fiber on skin, two thin strings at the neck undoing the world. Now, turn away. Sunlight is living in the storefront window and the shopkeeper wants her money. I want your opinion years from now when you've forgotten how I look in white. Roberta Spear. And I'd like to end with a poem of mine. Um, I mentioned the extraordinary poet Larry Levis. And um, he was my closest friend in or out of poetry for 30 years until his death in 1993. Um, 1996. And one of the things you need to know about this poem, there's just a couple of things. Um, it refers to a bet we made, and that bet will become evident in the poem. And the word triumph isn't anything grand, it's a motorcycle. And one of Larry's best known books is a book called Winter Stars. <clears throat> and this poem is called The One Who Should Write My Elegy Is Dead. 
The one who should write my elegy is dead. When we made that bet, he said most likely I'd be the loser writing his elegy instead. Nothing is as beautiful as nothing, he once said, so hip. Just chain-smoking camels are riding his shaky triumph up Van And the one who should write my elegy is dead. I guess I always knew I'd have to write my own elegy for him instead. Rambo on a tractor, Anna says, or Jagger pirouetting through the ranch's drying shed. The one who should write my elegy is dead. So I won't rehearse again those hungers that we fed or expose both the cruelties and those we shared. I'll simply try again to finish writing this last elegy instead of looking back. And tonight, my daughter Vivian's off with friends and Anna's reading of all things, winter stars in bed. And the one who should write my elegy is dead. And I'm the one, the loser, left here, just as he said I'd be left here, writing his elegy instead. And that's for Larry Levis. And now, let me introduce my dear friend and remarkable poet, Gail Ronsky. Thank you, David. Um, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be here in such esteemed company, as, as Robin said. It really is, and I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here. And uh, one question, David. I just want to make sure that all those fan letters I wrote to you when I was in college are going to be in the archive. I think they are there, although there are a couple I had to edit. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, the two poets I've chosen are Brenda Hillman and Wanda Coleman. Brenda from Northern California, Wanda, who you've already heard one of her poems tonight, from Southern California. And um, I think they're, they're kind of emblematic in a way. Brenda, what I find really fascinating about Brenda's work is its experimentation with language and form and its commitment not only to a kind of eco-poetics, but to an eco-poetics that it demands activism. You know, not just writing poems, but getting out there and doing things. And I think... Um, and there's also a kind of spiritual element to her poems, which I think this poem I've chosen has a little bit of that, a little bit of all of those things. It's describing tattoos to a cop. We'd been squatting near the worms in the White House lawn, protesting the Keystone pipeline. Money, 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 money. I could sense the deer worms through the grill work fence twists and coils of flexi script, remaking the soil by resisting it. After the ride in the police van, telling jokes, our zip locked handcuffs pretty tight. When the presiding officer asked, do you have any tattoos? Yes, officer, I have two. What are they? Well, I have a black heart on my inner thigh and an alchemical sign on my ankle. Please spell that. Alchemical, A-L-C-H-E-M-I-C-A-L. 
What is that? It's basically a moon, a lily, a star, and a flame. He printed, he started printing in a little square, moon, lily, star. Young white guy seemed scared. One blurry tattoo on his inner wrist. I should have asked about his, but couldn't cross that chasm. Outside, Ash Wednesday in our nation's capital. Dead grass, spring trees about to burst. Two officers beside the newish van. Inside, alchemical notes for the next time. This is... Uh, the alchemical, what I love about this poem is that the alchemical process she undertakes by writing the poem, right, is uh, alchemy. It's what she talks about in the poem. And so taking this experience of getting arrested for protesting the Keystone, Keystone Pipeline and making a poem out of it is like lead into gold. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have one of, um, of um, Wanda Coleman's American Sonnets. This is American Sonnet 35, and uh, I wish to heck Wanda was here to read it, <laughs> you know, because I look at this poem and I keep, I, I've rehearsed it a couple times, but, you know, I can't give it what she would have given it. This, uh, I chose this kind of because it's, it's kind of a Halloween poem. It's got ghosts in it. Boo, spooky ripplings of icy waves. This umpteenth time she returns. This invisible woman long on haunting, short on ectoplasm. You're a good man, sister, a lover side so long ago. Keep your oil slick and your motor running. Wretched, stained mirrors within mirrors of fractured webbings like nests of manic spiders reflect her ruined mien. Rue wiggles, remorse squiggles, woe jiggles bestride her. Oozy many spill out yonder spooling in night's lofty hour, exudes her gloom and spew in rankling odor of heavy heady dower as she strives to retrieve flesh to cloak her bones again to thrive to keep her poisoned id alive used to be young used to be gifted still black i love that poem and uh the thing i mean what, what wanda does that i think is similar to brenda is that they're both real experimental on the page you know and i think that's something that is that california is really open to it's a very i mean as we've seen tonight it's the sense of what a california poem is is so inclusive you know and it's so diverse and uh you know, the experimental nature is part of that. Um, okay, now I'm going to read my poem. And I thought I would be going last. I always go last. <laughs> so I thought I would end with something a little, mm, I don't know, energetic maybe. Embrace your flaws, then time will recognize your living. I use too many abstract words in poems and don't curse enough. Those are flaws by which I might be recognized in time. My partner is a romantic, which, by which I mean he would rather meditate in English cemeteries than go to the gym. Time knows this about him as it wraps soft manacles on his ankles and wrists, metonymic manacles of illness and constant obnoxious pain. I want to stop relying on sorrow, to watch the gray waves crest and plummet without seeing death in the plastic straws dropped about like clues in a murder mystery on the sand, the murder of the earth, I suppose. But there I go again with sorrow, with time. Flaws, they snag us. 
They remind us that our wrists and ankles were at one point feathered or furred, that we were at one time oblivious to time. Not that any of this means much to you, skeptical listener. You're watching birds on a wire, how they fly off one by one, or you're watching children splashing on the shore and thinking, you don't know what youth is, you little motherfuckers. See, you're just as flawed as I am, but in your own distinctive way. Time will be able to find both of us when the time comes. It'll rip us a new one. It'll render us all anti-intellectual, even me. <laughs> Thank you. And now um, let's welcome back all of the poets. All right. So I think switch back to uh, gallery view from speaker view now if they want. All right. Um, well, let me just ask the poets in the final 10 minutes now that we have. Um, if first, let me thank all of you for really extraordinary readings this evening and incredible selections. I'd be curious to hear you just say something now having at the end of the evening about your feelings, not just about California, but about the importance of place in your own work. And when you look at your poems, and you've all been writing for many, many years, what do you recognize in terms of where you've, what's home for you in your own poems? And why don't we just start with Dana and we'll just sort of go down the list. That's a good question, uh, David. I think in my case, I didn't really discover my own voice. I didn't really discover who I was as a poet until I began writing as a Californian until I sort of said I had to start where I started from the people I started from. And those, it's a place, and those are people who don't appear in poetry. You know, my dad's a Sicilian, my mom's a Mexican, I'm from Hawthorne, I went to school in Gardena. And this whole perspective just didn't exist in any of the poetry I read, but I understood that I had to somehow begin there to get anywhere uh, that, was, that was really my own destination. Great. Garrett. Oh, you know, I really love what Luis said about um, uh, his people uh, being unbordered across that false one that's been imposed. I think that we are all that way and the cultures and governments which have grown up around us have tried to think, create things that sunder us from that not simply a place, but a movement around places. My own family moved from Southern Japan to Hawaii for three generations, and then we came to LA. And there's a lot of contestation about who gets to write about what, whether it be Hawaii, Japan, or LA, you know, and I fought all those things because I find so much imposed and silencing. Um, I really like the, in Hawaii, there's this thing called ahapua'a, which is the same thing as a drainage or a plains or an area of continuous migration within um, that which sponsors us. So it could be California, it could be the whole continent, it could be across the ocean. Um, but I really love what Luis said in terms of his vision and his uh, adoration of his uh, ancestors and his, grand and his mother. Um, I think it starts like that. I think that that's that's powerful. Great, Robin. What would you like to add? Um, I I feel like everyone here could speak for me right now, and it would be fine. Everything that everyone just said. The only thing I would ask is I think that history uh, really is my home. Um, 
and I don't mean, uh, you know, it's history as we know it is such an erasure of actual human stories and human life and the evolution of human beings. Um, so I'm always aware of thousands of years of um, stories that we don't know. And I do think in terms chunks of millennia, if now I'm back 10,000 years, thousands of years at a time. And then I try to locate my own personal family's history within that by also thousands of years. I, I, I just don't accept, you know, I don't even, ex the, the whole calendar is, is a farce, it's manufactured, you know, it's 2020, no it isn't, right, we know that. So I'm more interested in locating my family and all the history that we've just discussed um, in broader terms because I think it would actually magnify how great our lives actually are. Um, the, listening to what Louise said, what Garrett said, what everybody else here said, you know, it's really easy as Americans to uh, be to think that what we're talking about is sentimentality, but we're not talking about sentimentality when we talk about home. We're talking about a very rigorous um, engagement with evolution. So that's what I like to think about when I think about Compton. I think about evolution. Great. Luis. Well, I think one of the most salient things that I'm trying to address, I think many poets are, especially in California, is being uprooted. It goes back to what Garrett was saying. You know, we are uprooted even when we live here. Even when we're here, we feel uprooted. We don't feel rooted even in California. And I think there's something to be said about why. Of course, we're looking for that land-based reality and uh I'm Californian. I say I'm Californian. I love California. I also know all the problems that California is undergoing. Many are man-made, manufactured, as Robin says, that I, I, I contend we have answers to that people don't want to go to, but we have them. So I would say the only thing to do when you're feeling uprooted is you got to feel at home no matter where you go. You got to make your home no matter where it is. You got to make home the quest of every story and every poem is really about being home. And I think, at least for me, that's important. I'm, I'm home now, regardless of the migration trek. I'm home and I want my poets, my poetry to express that without forgetting that uh, we've been uprooted and that should be recognized as well. Fabulous. Gail. Well, I love what everyone else has said. Um, I grew up it moving every year or every two years when I was a child. So I never had a home. And so, you know, and I used to watch the Rose Parade on TV and think that California was the most beautiful place. You know, there it is, we're sitting there with snow drifts up to the windows and somewhere there are roses going down the street, you know, and the sky is blue and it's beautiful. So I always wanted to move to California. I mean, obviously the reality of California is much different and much more complex, but California is the place where I really started to find my voice as a poet. And I have found it really welcoming and, uh, and uh, there are so many poets here. Luis, I'm so glad you mentioned Chiwan Choi. I just love him. Um, I just think it's, it's really exciting to be part of such a vibrant community of poets. And I'm never leaving. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we move toward seven o'clock, and the, I know the students in the workshop will need a few minutes um, to make the transition. Let me just end by once again thanking Dean Catherine Quinlan for her incredible graciousness in making this evening and this really special event possible. And also, of course, Tyson Gaskill, who I have to say, um, he's from Fresno too. <laughs> well, it's four against two, man. <laughs> still wins. Um, you know, Garrett and I have a good friend named Greg Pape, and one of Greg's favorite lines is, Gardena takes bets on the sunrise. <laughs> and, uh, 
what um, I'd also like to tell everyone here who's watching is that there are well over 200 people who've joined us today. And as I just quickly scrolled through the names, there are poets from all across the country, not simply poets from California. And I just want to thank everyone who took the time, who really came here to think about what place, what our values, and what poetry can do, what we can do in this incredible time. So thank you and thanks again to everyone involved for making this happen. And good night. <laughs>